Welcome everyone. My name again is Joan Gerhardt. I am the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy at the New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And I'd like to thank you all for coming today to learn a little bit more about domestic violence, both nationally as well as in New York State. We're gonna start off really at the end. We're gonna start with the four takeaways that we've identified that we'd like you all to remember well long after today's webinar. We're gonna get into each of these items much more specifically during the course of today's discussion. But to cut to the chase, we want you to know that New York has the highest demand for domestic violence services in the country. And this has been for several of the past, I think five or six years now. And in addition to that, we've also have the highest number of unmet requests for services uh, from domestic violence survivors in the country. So not a place where we wanna be number one, right? And not only do we have the highest demand, but that the requests for services increased at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, but have remained elevated, even though we're now entering right into our third year of the pandemic. Really, I guess the fourth year in March. So despite this increased demand, we want you to know that domestic violence advocates don't make a living wage. Most make only minimum wage. And employers can't raise these wages due to years of insufficient funding um, that's used to support domestic violence services across the state. And finally, we want you to know that we actually have a blueprint for how New York can fix these problems and make the provision of domestic violence services truly survivor-centered. So before I get into all of the detail supporting these four items, I wanna give you a little background on who NISCATIV is, who is the coalition. We were established more than 40 years ago. We are a not-for-profit and we are designated by the federal government as the Domestic Violence Information Clearinghouse and Resource Center on Domestic Violence for New York State. So every state in the country and its territories have a coalition like New York State, like NISCATIV. And what we do, we, we do a lot of work, but what's relevant for today's discussion is we work on developing policies, both at the state and federal level, that support the needs of domestic violence survivors and their families, as well as the service providers, the domestic violence agencies who are working in local communities to support them. We also provide a lot of education and training and technical assistance for domestic violence staff and other allied organizations, as well as the legislature and individuals and state agencies, as well as the governor's office. And all of the work that we do um, is with a lens of equity and inclusion, because we know particularly when we talk about crime and crime victims, there are certain segments of our population, namely black and brown individuals, as well as individuals from um, high poverty, marginalized communities who aren't treated equitably with respect to the provision of services or even in court practices and other um, human service uh, programming available in communities. So everything that we do has that intersectional lens to look at all of the considerations and factors that are addressing the needs of domestic violence survivors in our communities. We do have a couple of advocacy days throughout the year. We have two each year. The first is our budget advocacy day, which was just this week on Tuesday. I'm hoping you saw some of our advocates walking the halls or maybe met with us. Um, in addition to a legislative day of action, which is typically held in May. This year's event will be May 2nd, so I encourage you all to put it on your calendars now. Um, but this is our attempt to elevate the needs of domestic violence survivors uh, to the legislature and the governor. Um, these photos are from our last legislative day of action when we were in person in the well 
We certainly hope this year's uh, day is also in person. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, but we like to start the day with some of our legislative leaders um, speaking to us. We did have Governor Hochul, which he was Lieutenant Governor, and you can see there Assemblywoman Weinstein, Senator Kruger, um, several legislative leaders uh, speak to us on that day. It's, it's really a wonderful event. And then we are also fortunate to have had both the Assembly and Senate pass domestic violence related bills on that day, whenever our day of action is, as well as um, approve resolutions that memorialize the day as Dom Domestic Violence Awareness and Prevention Day. So we're certainly hoping to do the same in 2023 and hope to see many of you there and participating. So what is domestic violence? There is a lot of different, uh, excuse me, a lot of different um, definitions for domestic violence out there. And I just wanted to set the stage for what we think best describes domestic violence. It's a systematic pattern of power and control. So this is not a one type incident. This isn't a, a fight that might happen between two people that's never recreated, resurrected, happens again. This is a pattern of power and control that's perpetrated by one intimate partner against another. And it doesn't only include physical violence. It can be sexual violence. It can be threatening behavior. It can be economic control, control of the pocketbook, um, technological control, control of the phones, the cars, even the homes, security systems, and emotional and psychological abuse. And that's where we get back to the power and control tactics that make up domestic violence. And this type of behavior can result in physical injury and severe psychological trauma, even in some cases, death. And it would be, um, it would be a mistake to think that domestic violence only happens to certain people within society. It happens in every community. It's prevalent um, with all demographics. It impacts people regardless of age, regardless, regardless of socioeconomic factors, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, race, religion, nationality, ethnicity. It really doesn't matter. It cuts across all of those demographics, unfortunately. Now, when, when we look at that prevalence of domestic violence, we've, we have a lot of research on the incidence of domestic violence, both nationally as well as in New York State. So nationally, just starting here, on average, more than 10 million people are physically abused by an intimate partner. That's an astronomical number. In fact, in 2018, domestic violence accounted for 20% of all violent crime. One in three women and one in four men in the United States report experiencing some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. And 30 to 50% of transgender individuals report physical violence in an intimate relationship. Now that has significant ramifications for us as a country. The cost of intimate partner violence exceeds $8.3 billion a year, billion. So that includes all of the out-of-pocket expenses that someone would have to pay for after becoming a crime victim. It includes hospital care, mental health counseling, assistance with relocation, maybe getting a new home. It also includes the lost wages. Domestic violence survivors often can't report to work because of their injuries. So that's embedded within that $8.3 billion figure. So now taking a look specifically at domestic violence in New York State. 32% of New York women, so that's that one in three number. We also see that here in New York. And 29% of New York men 
experience intimate partner physical violence, sexual violence, or stalking in their lifetimes. For the last year that we have information from DCGIS, there were 61 intimate partner homicides in 2020 and over 165,000 orders of protection entered into the state registry. So think of the magnitude of this problem. In 2021, nearly 59,000 individuals reported to New York State that they were a domestic violence victim. So this brings me to our first takeaway that New York has the highest demand for domestic violence services in the country and the highest number of unmet service requests. How do we know this? We know this because our umbrella organization, which is called the National Network to End Domestic Violence, conducts an annual survey across the country where they go out on that day and ask all domestic violence agencies about the number of clients that they're helping on that day and the types of services that they're providing. And they do that on one day to ensure there's no duplication within the count. In New York in September of last year, we had more than 9,100 domestic violence victims, that's adults and children who received services. That's an astronomical number. And on that same day, in addition to the 9,100 who got services, there were 1,000 who couldn't get services. Now, why couldn't you get services? Well, maybe an advocate wasn't available. Maybe a position was vacant. Maybe the resources weren't available. Maybe the, the individual was looking for emergency shelter and there wasn't an open bed. Maybe they were looking for an affordable housing option and one couldn't be located. In fact, of these nearly thousand requests that we received in New York, 65% of them were for housing and emergency shelter. And that has usually been what we find with our annual census, that the need for housing and emergency shelter is the, the highest need and is the one that is most not met, if that makes sense. So other services that we know domestic violence survivors are looking for in addition to the residential, um, we sort of put these in a bucket of non-residential services. There's a lot of need for information and referral support. This is um, referral to other community-based organizations who might assist the survivor in whatever they're looking for. Um, we advocate on behalf of that survivor with other community-based organizations to get them community services, to get them programming and support. We provide counseling services, particularly crisis intervention services and emotional support. And a lot of what we do is providing legal advocacy. So I don't mean legal services in, ter in terms of attorneys, although we might be referring Cl cl our clients to legal, legal services. But legal advocacy is accompanying a survivor to court. Often they don't know um, if there is a, a criminal proceeding, whether they're engaged in one or their uh, partner is engaged in criminal proceedings or in the civil court with child custody, with um, child welfare services. There's a lot of advocacy support that we provide to victims in court. There's job training and assistance, skills development, assistance with children, daycare services or after school programming, as well as support groups, having uh, survivors meet with their peers to talk about their experiences and get support. So this leads me to our second takeaway which is that the request for domestic violence services increased during the pandemic, which I'm hoping you all heard something about because it has been widely covered in the press. But unfortunately, these increases haven't decreased now that we're you know, three years out from the start of the pandemic. They've remained elevated. 
And let me provide you with some statistics to support this. So of those 9,100 victims who received services in our 2022 census, that was actually 844 more individuals seeking help on that day than in 2021, and more than 3,300 more individuals than in 2020. So this is an upward trend. This is not where we want New York to be. With respect to the orders of protection that were issued in 2021, this was an 18% increase from 2020. Calls to the hotline have increased 34% since the start of the pandemic and have remained at those elevated levels. And we certainly know that the, that the incidence of violent crime being reported to police has increased. In fact, from 2021 to 2022, um, it has increased 7.8% according to data from DCJS, and that's a statewide figure. So with all of these increases, you know, all of these indicators pointing to a disturbing trend with respect to the need for domestic violence services, what I want to convey is to, to get across that now is not the time to be cutting services for crime victims, for domestic violence victims and for all crime victims. We're also seeing a little bit of a change in the types of um, requests and needs that survivors are experiencing today. We're certainly seeing an increased demand for mental health services. And we welcome some of the initiatives that the governor included in the executive budget this year to, to ramp up or increase availability and accessibility of mental health services. We see increased requests for all of those information and referral services that we provide. We also see that the domestic violence incidents that our clients are contending with have an increased level of lethality associated with them. And lethality equates to violence. When a domestic violence incident involves violence, they usually are the more complicated, more complex type of incident, which requires more resource, more advocacy to help navigate a survivor through. So all of that requires more time and more expense on the part of domestic violence service providers to assist those survivors experiencing that heightened risk, the heightened lethality. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, we continue to see an increased need for housing options. And that's statewide, everywhere, and it's certainly not just impacting domestic violence victims. But I do also wanna point out that some of the difficulty in finding alternative housing for domestic violence survivors is that it's, it certainly has to be affordable housing, that is key, but it also has to be affordable and safe housing. And not every affordable unit is a safe one for a domestic violence survivor. So that's sort of a sticky wicket that we have to keep in mind. So our third takeaway is that despite this increased demand, domestic violence advocates do not make a living wage and employers can't raise wages due to years of insufficient funding. So we know the critical role that domestic violence advocates serve in the communities across the state. These are dedicated, passionate professionals who do very challenging, traumatic work. So traumatic that there's a term for it called vicarious trauma, which describes the type of trauma that someone experiences themselves when assisting other people through their trauma. This is not easy work to do, and it requires unique skills and talents. It's also not a desk job. It requires us to go meet domestic violence survivors where they are, at the police station, at court, in the hospital. These are not desk jobs. 
And for all of these reasons, New York State appropriately designated domestic violence advocates as frontline essential workers during the pandemic. And that's a really good thing because we saw the increase in domestic violence need during that time. So talking a little bit about wages for domestic violence advocates, it might surprise you to learn that most domestic violence advocates don't earn a living wage. In fact, many advocates make minimum wage. And when you think about the type of job that this is, doing this, this challenging 24 hour a day, seven days a week job at minimum wage, it questions how could someone even do this with all of this trauma and challenge associated with it. In fact, we know that most domestic violence advocates can't afford a two bedroom rental. And there are domestic violence advocates who actually take on a second job just so they can continue doing this work because they feel that this is the work that they want to do. It might also surprise you to learn that domestic violence advocates haven't been included in any of last year's salary increases, the bump in minimum wage, bonuses, or the COLA, and they're not proposed to be included in this year's COLA. Now, last year's COLA focused on medical and mental health workers on home health aides doing very similar work that we do as domestic violence advocates. This year's COLA proposal actually focuses on programs within certain state agencies. And I wanna point out that OCFS, which licenses domestic violence programs, is included, many programs within OCFS are included in this year's COLA proposal, but not domestic violence providers. So to give you an example, there are foster care and youth shelter operators included in this year's proposal, but not domestic violence shelter operators. So one type of shelter, not another type of shelter. Included in this year's proposals are those who provide supportive services to youth. Domestic violence advocates provide supportive services to youth in shelter, but we're not included. This year's proposal also includes community service providers who assist the elderly. Domestic violence advocates also provide supportive services to victims of elder abuse. There really is no justification for this disparity between certain human service sectors and others. And we think it's time that New York State truly values the work of domestic violence advocates as New York rightfully has other human service workers. But more important than the value is that this has had a disastrous impact on our ability to recruit and retain staff. There are hundreds, thousands of vacancies across domestic violence agencies statewide. NISCADIV did a staff survey last year with our sister coalition, the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And in that survey, 90% of respondents reported staff turnover between 2021 and 2022. So virtually no program has escaped this great resignation, which we know other, other types of sectors have had to contend with as well. Within domestic violence agencies and sexual assault agencies, um, nearly 1,200 departures have been reported. So when you extrapolate that statewide, we believe that there are thousands of openings in domestic violence agencies. So what does this actually mean for service provision? Well, you obviously can't do the same level or amount of service with fewer employees. So we're seeing senior level employees overextended because they are taking up the work of open vacancies in the positions that they supervise. 
We're seeing agencies having to hire less experienced personnel, and that requires more training and onboarding, a longer time to get them up to speed, ready to help serve domestic violence victims. We're seeing extremely long wait times for survivor services, particularly with respect to mental health services and group um, support services. And we're also seeing advocates um, trying to deal with the challenge of staying survivor-centered, so doing everything they can to provide the services that survivors are seeking with fewer employees. In fact, unfortunately, in several cases, we can do little more than provide these survivors with the, the most minimal essential services that they need. We can't go above and beyond to give them truly survivor-centered support. Now, I'd like to talk a minute about how we fund domestic violence services in New York State. Almost all of the funding that is used to support domestic violence services um, it are federal funding streams that come into New York. There is the VAWA Act money, Violence Against Women Act. There is VOCA money, which is Victims of Crime Act. There's FIPSA funding that goes through OCFS. There's TANF funding. There's Title 20 funding. All of this funding goes to different state agencies in New York um, for administration and disbursement to domestic violence programs. Some of it is based by, um, is distributed by formula and other is by competitive procurement that goes out through contracts. One of the federal funding streams that is really the primary funding stream for domestic violence providers is VOCA. VOCA funding has been decreasing over the last several years. And this is because the amount of money that is collected by Congress for these grants has been decreasing. To give you an idea of how much, between 2018 and 2022, the VOCA grant coming into New York has decreased more than $115 million. Now VOCA, like I said, is the largest funding source for many providers, but it doesn't just go to domestic violence providers. It also is used for sexual violence, child sexual abuse, child advocacy centers, victims of homicide, legal assistance organizations, um, it goes to victims of robbery, for accidents, um, all different types of crime victims. And what we see is that because of the federal dollars coming into New York State, decreasing to such a high level, that the amount of awards going out to programs has been decreasing. And I'll get to, to that in a little more detail in a moment. But our fourth takeaway is that New York can fix these problems and make the provision of domestic violence services truly survivor-centered. So we've identified four specific steps that New York can take that would improve the situation and ensure the continuity of services for domestic violence survivors and their families. The first relates to wages. We need to get domestic violence advocates earning a living wage. And to do that, we want to see the state increase minimum wage for all domestic violence staff by $3 an hour, and for the first time provide a cost of living adjustment to these workers who are licensed through OCFS. Um, it, we're asking for a 5.4% COLA, which is the same amount that was provided to health and mental health care uh, providers last year. And this would signify to domestic violence advocates that the state recognizes the critical work that they do, that the state recognizes their role as frontline essential workers. And I also want to point out that there's, I think, a, a little bit of a gendered piece here. We know that 
you know, the majority of domestic violence advocates are women who are helping predominantly other women and children. And it's time that the state really values the work of women in this regard. This will stop the transition of staff out of domestic violence agencies and fill the vacant positions that exist, many of which domestic violence agencies can't even attempt to fill because they're not sufficiently funded to fill those positions any longer. The second step relates to another federal funding stream coming into the state, which is the state's $1.5 billion TANF grant. This is essentially the welfare dollars that come into the state from the federal government. There is an earmark that has been set in the budget for TANF, specifically for non-residential domestic violence services. Since the year 2000, that's the first time that we saw this specific earmark for non-residential domestic violence ser services. Now, remember, you know, I mentioned that census that we did, that we do every year. And last year in 2022, 38% of all the requests that came in that 9,100 9, number, 38% of those requests were for non-residential services. And that, in, that demand is increasing. That 38% was actually a thousand more requests for non-residential services than we saw in 2021. Back in 2000, when this earmark was first set, it was set as $3 million. Would it surprise you to learn that it's essentially still $3 million today, 23 years later? Now, just to correct for inflation, it would be around 5 million today. And that doesn't even include the increased demand that we've seen for non-residential services. And the important thing to note is that now again, this is TANF funding. So it's not, it's not state general revenues. This is TANF funding. If we were to earmark an additional $3 million for a total of 6 million for non-residential services, that's just a, a tiny, tiny percentage, certainly less than 1% of that $1.5 billion grant that comes into New York. But it's also less than 1% of what we know is sitting in the state's pocketbook right now, not being spent. We know this because there's an organization called the Center for Budget Priorities. It's a national organization that looks at how states use their TANF funding. And this organization informed us that New York has not spent 37% of its TANF block grant. So the money is sitting there in state coffers. We just need to earmark more of it for non-residential domestic violence services to help meet the demand. Our third step, relates to the VOCA cuts. So you might remember that in last year's state budget, um, there, there was a lot of discussion about the decreased federal funding available under VOCA and the Office of Victim Services, who serves as the state administrator for VOCA funds, um, was forecasting some pretty significant cuts for victim service providers. Now, again, this isn't just domestic violence service providers, but all victim service providers in the state. As a result, the governor committed to transferring $14.4 million from the state's general funds to OVS each year over the next three years. We were very happy and thankful, grateful, that the legislature and governor included this $14.4 million in last year's final budget. And we continue to be grateful that the governor included the second installment of this $14.4 million in this year's executive budget. So we are asking the legislature to accept this governor's 
proposal for this year's budget and maintain that transfer in this year's uh, final budget. In addition though, even with these installments of the $14.4 million, when OVS issued its latest round of VOCA grants last summer, nearly 90 victim service organizations received less funding in this round, the 2022 round, than under prior contracts to the tune of $11.7 million. So these 87 programs were cut a total of $11.7 million. It's just not sustainable. It's not realistic to ask these programs to do the same level of work that they've been doing with cuts of this kind. We're asking the legislature to incorporate an additional $11.7 million. So this would be new funding to OVS and dedicate it specifically for these legacy victim service providers, legacy because they've already been contracting with the state for these services, but got cut in this latest round to make them whole. So we don't want this 11.7 million going to the overall pot of VOCA funding. We want it to go specifically to these providers who received less funding in 2022. And the fourth thing that New York State can do to improve the situation, um, the provision of domestic violence services across the state is to move away from a competitive procurement process for domestic violence services. We don't believe that when you're looking at essential frontline services, human services, helping the most vulnerable New Yorkers navigate the paths in front of them, that we should have these service providers competing with one another for critical dollars. We need to ensure that these services are available consistently across the state, continuously. So consistent and continuous. And competitive procurements don't enable that to happen. Essentially, competitive procurements require domestic violence agencies in Syracuse, as an example, to compete against domestic violence agencies in the Hudson Valley. Now, when you do that, there's a winner and a loser to that game. So which domestic violence agency do we want to lose? Do we want domestic violence services to be less accessible in the Hudson Valley than they are in Syracuse? I don't think so. So even though competitive procurements make sense, for certain types of sectors, maybe economic development comes to mind. When you're talking about essential services, stabilizing services for the long term, making sure that victims have access to those services where and whenever they need them, we have to move away from competitive procurements. And to do that, we're asking the state to include organizational viability language into the state budget wherever federal funds are used to support domestic violence services. Let's move away from competitive procurements and give these agencies the foundational funding they need to help domestic violence survivors statewide. So that is everything I was hoping to convey to you today. I know I've done a lot of talking. I think there's been some activity in the chat. Um, Brittany, can you help me navigate the chat if there's anything in there that I should be addressing? So all of the questions thus far have been answered. So if folks have other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, but I do want to uplift one thing that is in the chat that folks can still sign on to Assemblymember Burdick's and Assemblymember Rosenthal's budget letter requesting the $11.7 and there is contact information in the chat. Um, 
will these slides be made available to us? Yes, these slides will be made available to all participants. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. And, and please, you know, if anyone has any, it doesn't have to be a question per se, if you have any feedback or reflections that you would like to let us know about, um, any interests that you're hearing uh, from survivors in, in your communities about legislation that could assist them, um, I do want to make sure everyone has uh, a way to get in touch with me. Uh, we're always open to discuss legislative initiatives um, or other ways to improve circumstances for survivors, navigating state agencies, making it easier to uh, understand the resources and support services available to them. So please don't hesitate to communicate with us either via the chat or by reaching out to me by email. Um, and we, you know, we'll certainly hang on for a few minutes to make sure that there are no uh, issues or more conversation in the chat. I see there's a question about our legislative priorities. Um, there, there's, uh, there's a couple that actually do have um, primes that are just waiting to be reintroduced because of some tweaks to the language, but there might be one or two that um, are still seeking a, a prime. So if you would like to send me an email about that, I'm, I'm happy to engage more on that. Okay, well, I think that uh, I, I don't see much activity in the chat. So I think I'll thank everyone again for being here today. Um, thank you for taking the time. I know there's a lot of different pressures on your time, so we really do um, we really do thank you for uh, being here with us. And if there is any other information you're looking for or would like to discuss these issues in more detail, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at NISCADIV. Thank you, know, you so much. Yes. Before we close out, we do have a question that came into the Q and A. Oh. You mentioned affordable and safe housing. What would you say is constituent? what would you say constitutes safe housing? Oh, safety really depends on the individual survivor. Um, it could include items like um, where their uh, partner might be living or the partner's family. It could mean access to public transportation. So the individual might not have to walk far or drive a long way. Um, it could be any number of things. It could be um, uh, where the unit is positioned in an apartment building, whether it's on a first floor or a higher level floor. It could be just based on the experiences of that survivor. If, if an incident occurred in a certain type of setting or in a certain manner, that they would be seeking a different type of setting. So it really is very specific to the survivor. And that's why identifying those units with an advocate working through those issues is so important. That's a great question. So thank you very much for that. Well, thank you again, everyone. And we'll see you again soon.